Um, thank you, Patrick, for a wonderful talk. Uh, not only because it was focused on GABA, my favorite neurotransmitter system, but it, uh, very intriguing. But did anybody notice that Patrick put the 56-year-old brain in the bucket of old? Anybody notice that? Oh, but that doesn't apply to any of you. No. It's variation. You guys all have young brains. Yeah, there you go. I didn't, uh, that, didn't, that didn't escape me. So I've renamed this preclinical studies. Um, are the data always reproducible? And a few disclosures. So I have no financial disclosures, but as a result of work in my lab, the University of Toronto now holds several patents. These are reused patents for drugs that inhibit subtypes of GABA receptors as memory enhancing strategies. We've also developed some new materials that target another uh, subtype of GABA A receptor, alpha-5. Uh, I collaborate with um, investigators who undertake clinical studies looking at cognition in adults in the perioperative period, and that team receives in-kind support from CogState, which is a company that makes software um, to assess cognition. Uh, all the studies I'm going to present or even talk about from my lab are funded by uh, peer review sources, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, which is the equivalent of the NIH. I am a member of the Board of Trustees and also help with the Executive um, Scientific Advisory Committees and Executive Council. So when you come on the IRS board, you're, you're voluntold for different activities. And I had the great privilege and honor of being asked to help with smart tots. Uh, I want to disclose that I am not a content expert. I don't undertake um, studies in neurotoxicity, but I really had the great pleasure and honor of working with investigators from around the world who are doing some incredibly important, interesting and powerful work. Um, I um, want to direct my comments today really to the catalytic role of smart tots and how we can uh, better serve that community and use the smart tots to uh, really leapfrog and advance the work. So I think we all understand the overarching problem that um, there is a, a growing concern about the potential Toxic, uh, toxic properties of anesthetics to the developing brain. And that work really stemmed from preclinical studies with some clinical data and more important clinical data we're going to hear about today. But it is controversial. The area is controversial because uh, the data, the human data, we don't have irrefutable human data to, to, to indicate the drugs are indeed neurotoxic. And yet these clinical and preclinical uh, data are influencing public policy. Shresh mentioned the FDA warning that came out in December 2016. And the stakes are high. We don't want to be alarming um, parents or, and patients needlessly um, so that kids are not having uh, surgeries that they may benefit from. But on the other hand, uh, in this era of disclosure, they deserve to know where the field sits. And I certainly think that was the intent of the FDA to share the information that we have about the potential neurotoxic effects of the drugs. Uh, one challenge is that uh, the results can't always be uh, re reproduced from preclinical studies. Um, and uh, that, that sort of further muddies the water. Uh, reproducibi re reproducibility builds trust. Uh, uh, and uh, irreproducibility builds distrust. So as a community, I think we need to be very transparent and deal with this issue um, and, and really think about how we can generate data that informs clinical trial and hence clinical practice. So the, the three topics I want to briefly talk on today, because I want to leave time for discussion, is let's just reflect back on some of the key goals of preclinical research in the context of pediatric anesthesia, anesthetic neurotoxicity, and then think how as a group we can um, uh, work as a community to ensure the relevance and reproducibility of results, and then some practical steps forward to improve clinical trials. So overall, our goal, at least in this context, one of the main goals is to generate data that informs the design of clinical trials so they're both relevant, uh, they have relevant, meaningful outcomes. That sounds pretty obvious, but it's not. And Patrick was just referring to the periods of critical development and critical plasticity, and you can see now how depending on when and how you undertake the studies, you may get different behavioral outcomes. Uh, and so when you're looking between drugs or between conditions, that uh, becomes pretty hard to think about how you would design a trial in an animal model to be relevant to non-human primate studies and then further up to clinical trials. These are not easy problems to solve. Further, at a more reductionist level, we want to gain mechanistic insights that advance um, the discovery of mitigation strategies and then consider, um, you know, there's a number of strategies already available, lithium, um, uh, a whole list of, of, of potential neuroprotectants, 
But once those are discovered, uh, how do we undertake the comparative studies in preclinical models? And then uh, once the um, lead compounds evolve up, uh, undertake the first, um, the data, uh, the studies to inform first in human. So um, Shahil Doshi, who's the CEO of Mixed Panel, a 20-year-old entrepreneur who last week sold his company for $1 billion, um, uh, offered this quote, most of the world will make decisions by either guessing or using their gut. They will either be lucky or wrong. Um, and that's true. What we, we want to drive our science, and this field is with data, 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 but good data. Uh, as we say in the lab, uh, bad data is worse than no data. So, so how do we really inform ourselves as a community to, to uh, move forward effectively? I think most of us in the room are familiar with this really sentinel po paper from Vesna 2003. Um, it was influenced, uh, she was I'm sure influenced by John Olney and the community that initially started in the alcohol field. It, it um, spread over to anesthetics um, using rat models and the field has evolved considerably now. For example, we have investigators in the room involved in very sophisticated non-human primate studies. I want to give a shout out to Merle Paul, who retired last year, but the FDA crew has been working hard to look at, for example, uh, micropet studies tagging microglia, uh, showing um, likely an inflammatory event that it happens after a very reasonable short period of anesthesia in a population of non-human primates that were well supported. So this notion that the toxicity is an indirect effect uh, is inconsistent with, with these um, more sophisticated large animal models. And along with the, ephemera, uh, the PET studies, um, they undertook um, histological studies, again confirming there is neurodegenerative changes after a, a period of exposure to anesthetic drugs. So the point of showing these two studies is really just to say that, that we see uh, a range of studies in species age drug duration. Vesna's study was with um, midazolam, nitrous, and isofluorine. The more recent was sevoflurane and so forth, studying various brain regions and different behaviors. So, so in a sense, the, the field has evolved from very committed, highly skilled investigators working in different areas trying to work collectively uh, to move the field forward. But the question is, can we work more in a more coordinated manner? And a Smart Arts had a preclinical interest group that, that exchanged ideas, and one notion that came forward is, well, is it possible to have two labs that, have, um, that utilize similar models, ask the similar questions, and let's see what the data looks like in terms of reproducibility. And the question that was asked was, uh, does dexmedetomidine, an alpha-2 agonist, itself have any neurotoxic properties, and or does it have any neuroprotective properties against sevoflurane-induced anesthesia? And there was, in a sense, some urgency about addressing this, these questions because the trials are already underway to look at whether DEX is neuroprotective. So there's the T-Rex trial led by Andrew Davidson, and Dean Anadropoulos has a, a DEX trial, with, which I'm sure we're going to hear about during discussion period. Um, so folks are already thinking that DEX may be neuroprotective. It is anesthetic sparing in the sense the GABAergic drug doses can be reduced. So there may be some value in that. And it does promote the release of potential neuroprotectant factors. So there's a strong rationale for undertaking these studies. But what happens in, in um, preclinical models, particularly when two labs undertake the same studies? And uh, Ansgar is here somewhere. Um, and I, and um, I'm uh, presenting some of his data, um, as well as uh, one of the other investigators who took up the charge and accepted the uh, challenge of undertaking near identical studies in two different labs. And um, I'm sure he'll tell you a bit more about the, the de details during the discussion. So Amsgar and Andres Lopke um, undertook very similar experiments using uh, seven-day-old rat pups and presented six hours of one mac sevoflurane in a warm, oxygenated environment and then um, looked at um, changes in, in, in um, brain histology as evidenced by caspase 3 staining. And the uh, results, of, some of the key results are shown in these two slides where um, uh, the, I wonder if there's a pointer here, yeah. So uh, in terms of the sevoflurane effects and the dex effects, either sevoflurane um, alone, 
or DEX alone are shown here in these bar graphs. And first of all, uh, DEX um, had uh, a modest but not significant effect, except at the higher concentrations on caspase 3 staining. One MAC of uh, SIVO uh, obviously had a, a large effect, and that was attenuated when the animals were co-treated with a DEX at a lower and higher dose. Is that fair, Ansgar? That's one of the main findings. Um, in contrast, what uh, Andre's lab showed was, again, DEX alone had a little effect on caspase 3 staining, same endpoint, um, uh, a slight increase at the, the higher concentration, and he used a dose that was higher than Ansgar. But interestingly, when we look at the effects of SIVO plus DEX, which is shown in the red bars, um, there was uh, an increase in caspase 3 staining in animals co-treated with DEX. Now, there were some methodologic differences. Um, for example, Ansgar, I think you euthanized the animals under deep anesthesia immediately after the six hours, whereas uh, just reading through the papers, Andres um, allowed them to recover for 30 minutes and then gave them a ketamine xylazine uh, euthanasia and then section. So there were some uh, probably minor modifications between protocols, but overall the six-hour insult or, or duration of anesthesia was the same. And ANSCAR team did something which was very important, and they looked at the, uh, the blood chemistry, and both teams uh, reported physiologic parameters. And you can see here, this is one MAC of anesthesia after six hours, and, and the animals are acidotic, hypercarbic, with uh, base excess shown here. And that was exacerbated when the animals were co-treated with DEX, uh, as shown here. I guess one of the, the indicators is, is uh, PACO2, um, which, which uh, increased dramatically, and there was a marked reduction in respiratory uh, drive and uh, uh, higher mortality with this combination of animals, uh, drugs. And the mortality data from the two, two teams are shown here, uh, Andres, and ANSGARs here, and that, I think that's where you see the biggest variability between the data sets is, is in mortality. Um, here with this combination, zero to almost a quarter of the animals, uh, let's say almost 20% and 50%, and you can see here that all the animals in, under, uh, in ANSGAR's um, group died half in the other. So that's quite a marked difference between the labs, and yet the experimental design was, was agreed on and carefully executed. So I think that's, that's very telling about some of the challenges we're going to face as we, as we move through looking for mitigation strategies. But I really want to thank them for doing those experiments. Um, uh, there was a call for proposals, and those two teams stepped up to the plate. And I think they really did us a favor in forming the field. And uh, it's, um, we'll, we'll take some lessons from that as we move forward. There was a very nice editorial that accompanied the publication of those studies in the British Journal of Anesthesia by Jeff Saul and Dr. Let Letzkitz. And, and um, I encourage you to read that editorial. Um, and the suggestion was, as the field moves forward, as we evolve, the neonatal rat pup might not be the best model uh, to look at implementation strategies or mitigation strategies given the physiologic uh, perturbation. And the, the request went forward to shift to larger animals, guinea pigs, piglets, non-human primates, um, at least for um, when you're trying to Im Im imply that the drugs themselves, independent of the cardiorespiratory changes, are causing neurotoxic uh, effects. And then ask investigators to predisclose their protocols to prevent cherry picking of data, um, non disclosure of mortality, and um, adhere to reporting guidelines such as the ARRIVE guide, guidelines criteria. That is, um, it's almost like the, con the concert diagrams and reporting structures that are available for all clinical trials, which we all embrace now. We develop the same or adopt the same standards for plea clinical trials, especially in this field where I say that, again, the stakes are high. So the, the notion of reproducibility is not, is not uh, unique to anesthesia research. And uh, in 2013, um, Nature, the, 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 the prestigious journal Nature had a number of papers dealing with the, the challenges related to reproducibility. Um, in, in data sets, and they introduced a life science checklist for authors where uh, they, they expect uh, very broad disclosure with the data sets, full publication of data sets. 
um, and, and detailed methodologies and they relax the guidelines, online guidelines in terms of word limits for methodology. And I think this is something that, that we as a community really need to think about. We have to find a way to share the details of our methods. And um, we'll talk about sources of variability, but this is one that we can do something about, is, is simply disclose the, the details of the experiments we're undertaking. So there's two, two big uh, concerns related to um, variability, uh, experimental variability, and that's something we can do, at least we can disclose and be um, transparent, and of course biologic variability, and that gets a little, little trickier, and I'll just, in the interest of time, uh, focus on experimental variability, because this is something that, even in my own lab, that we've, 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 um, we've seen the challenge. So we've been using a, a certain behavioral assay, uh, object recognition, uh, first published in 2012. So, so the last seven, seven or eight years, we've been using a test that seems intuitively very simple, and you'd think, boy, we shouldn't have much trouble with that. And the test relies on the um, innate um, curiosity of an animal, whether it be a mouse or, or a person, for novelty. And so you put an animal in a context, give them two objects, let them explore and become familiar with the objects. After a time interval, uh, place them back in that context, replace one object with a familiar object. And if the uh, animal remembers the, the um, familiar object, they will naturally gravitate to the novelty. So this, uh, we call this the little red sports car assay. Right? We all love novelty uh, for shopping. So we can couple that assay, which, which attempts to measure me memory um, as a, and, and the readout is interaction time with the objects, and then couple that with various experimental um, interventions which aim to um, alter memory. For example, we can give an anesthetic drug, wash it out for a certain time period, and then train the animals, give them familiar objects after time interval, introduce the novel objects, and assess memory. And so uh, what we see typically in the, in, the, uh, in the control animals is the animals spend more time with the novel object than the familiar object. And surprisingly, those that have seen isofluorine a day, sometimes two days beforehand, have no apparent um, recall for the familiar object. Well, that all sounds like a very straightforward experiment. But what we started to see is that when, when different experimenters did the um, training and the testing, the results were very different. Uh, and in fact, the influence, uh, the, the, the outcome of the study was influenced by strain of mice, time, time of day, handling of the animals, stress of the animals, presence of um, a habituation phase, do we let them just sit in the arena? Uh, lighting, choice of, choice of objects had a huge effect, uh, duration of training, the duration of the interval. Uh, all of which seem to have an effect. So what we've started to do now is completely blind the investigators to treatments, but have a single investigator run a group of animals to try and minimize the variability. And others have seen this in this particular assay and reported the same findings, that, that despite being a, a very simple, straightforward assay, there is a var a variance between um, investigators. And some experimenters have, have uh, undertaken the rigor of trying to look at these types of variables. Uh, including Lauren Martin. Um, some of you may have met Lauren. He was a grad student in the lab and then went on to work with Jeff Mogul at uh, McGill University. And their team had noticed that depending on the gender or the, the, um, the sex of the investigator that the, the pain response of animals changed. And uh, Jeff and Lauren and his team being the rigorous investigators they are went after this systematically to see uh, was it true that the um, exposure to males male mice or men influence the uh, apparent um, nociceptive response to animals. And uh, the experiment involved uh, introducing an inflammatory um, injury and then looking for nociceptive behavior either through an objective video scoring of grimace of the face of the animals, so there's no one actually touching or involved with the, with the animals, as well as an open field assay where they could look at um, Thigmotaxis, sorry, which is just how long they remain a wallflower or the number of times they defecate body temperature, cortisol levels, as measures of pain and anxiety. And what they found was the gender of the person in the room uh, had, a, had a large impact on the behaviors um, as measured with a grimace scale or open field test. So here you see some of the data. Um, with no one in the room, the scores would be one, and female is, um, whoops, I'll tell you about Paris Hilton. Um, the females are pink and the males are, are blue, and you can see the difference in, in the performance on the grimace scale 
and then also for the nociceptive uh, tail withdrawal, paw withdrawal, and von Frey assay. So um, uh, what the Paris Hilton thing was, Lauren used to call this the Paris Hilton experiment because they had this cutout of Paris Hilton as the female, and um, they would drape T-shirts that they'd slept in um, over the model because as it turned out, the signal was not visual, that was a control they, they took care of, but rather olfactory. Um, the um, reviewers would not allow the Paris Hilton comments into the manuscripts, uh, but this is in the community known as the Paris Hilton experiment with the T-shirt. So they, what they learned from that is the experimenter and the, and, the, and the sex of the experiment was very important in terms of seeing different beha behavioral outcomes, and this was due to olfactory cues uh, from the, um, uh, emitted from the investigators. And this doesn't influence just uh, pain scores. There was an abstract at 27 um, Society for Neuroscience where in the uh, field of depression models and for swim tests that the antidepressant effects of ketamine and the behavioral responses were again dependent on the gender of the, inve uh, the sex of the investigator. Um, and the, uh, the uh, team suggested that exp um, experiment or gender may, may affect uh, rep whether you can reproduce the study and, and should be considered as an important experimental variable. And I think we're seeing this in our own work as it relates to GABA-A. And there's a number of factors that influence uh, uh, whether it can be replicated. Um, and and uh, this is one of them. And these are all very inconvenient truths that we need to think about when we're designing, but more importantly, sharing the design of our experiments. And just one final uh, comment about biologic variability, because we're going to hear a really interesting um, study from David as we move forward. Uh, this one's even harder to crack. Um, and so uh, there was a study um, last week or two weeks ago in Nature that looked at what happens when you give one inflammatory insult versus multiple inflammatory insults. And the response of the brain and behavior was very different. So when you give an endotoxin like LPS to a mouse and look at the response of the innate immune cells in the brain, the microglia, uh, whether that insult occurs once or uh, four times is not in any way cumulative. Um, when you, uh, um, the LPS, by the way, does not get into the brain, but rather through either the gut neuronal axis or migration of monocytes into the brain or uh, transmission of neuroinflammatory um, factors into the brain, you do see an activation of microglia with peripheral injury. So the brain is inflamed when you introduce a peripheral injury. Uh, what they found with one versus four is the microglia appeared to go from rather a training response, that is an active inflammatory response, to a tolerance, anti-inflammatory response. Um, and the, um, the levels of cytokines in the serum and in the brain are shown here. And interestingly, whoops, I'm not used to this computer, I apologize. Um, the... Um, yeah, so you can see the, um, the brain is the most interesting. This is following um, one and two injections, but after you increase the number of injections, you start to see an attenuation of that response and activation of the anti-inflammatory cascade with high levels of IL-10 and lower levels of IL-1 beta. And they did the you know, all the types of controls that you would expect for a, a study in nature, and it appears that whether the training mode of the uh, uh, microglia or the um, tolerance mode of the microglia is invoked is dependent on the, on the a number of insults that are presented. So you can see some of the challenges that, uh, that are going to evolve as we try and look at multiple exposures to anesthetics and the timings around that. Moreover, whether the, the, astro, the microglia were in a training or tolerance mode influenced the ability of the brain to respond to disease. So they have used an Alzheimer model um, the APP23 mouse, which um, uh, uh, produces uh, premature beta amyloid, and asked whether the microglia could clean up the beta amyloid, and they found if there was only one injection, you would see that that did not occur. The microglia seemed busy being in an inflamed state, whereas uh, there was um, mopping up uh, over a several month period of uh, beta amyloid um, in those animals that were in a more tolerant state. And they also used a stroke model and showed the same thing. So this is just a comment that uh, the biologic variability, especially as we move into multiple anesthetics or prolonged anesthetics, is going to be uh, intriguing. So how do we solve this issue about reproducibility and transparency as suggested by this, um, this magnifying glass? 
Uh, and uh, science, again, as well as nature, has been talking about this. And um, I think it's uh, about transparency and trying to get the details out. This was uh, highlighted in 2016 with uh, uh, Jim Eisenach's uh, comments in Anesthesiology about, about import, improving our transparency and reporting of, of, uh, of design and, and data sets. And so uh, hopefully today and, and as we move forward, we'll have a conversation about how that happens. And some of the editorials around um, uh, Ansgar's and Andres's papers deal with this. Um, and I'm sure Lena is going to be uh, driving this as well, looking at number one, coordinating a bit of a roadmap for both the clinical and the preclinical teams. Um, not, you know, we all have our various areas of interest, but trying to coordinate efforts, especially replicating key findings, um, maybe getting consensus-based best practice um, and perhaps checklist is what, what we would expect as reviewers uh, to see now as the field moves forward and get independent replication of key findings in, in more than one lab. Uh, and measure physiologic parameters in the various models so we can tease out the indirect effects from the actual potential neurotoxic effects and, and begin to better define injury and mitigation. What does that mean within this field? Uh, I think it, the easy part is, uh, is through sharing, and that means providing the details when we can through the journals, but perhaps on our lab websites. Uh, or in separate publications uh, about how we're undertaking these experiments, obviously the face-to-face, -face, and then letting the Smart Tots group understand how we can help facilitate this, this, um, this process to, to move things forward expeditiously, expeditiously, and I think Lena, as I mentioned, is going to play a very big role. Um, but the big difference that happened in the last year with Smart Tots is we've gone to a content expert now to help uh, lead the team and organize the team uh, as we all move forward. So we might think that, you know, we are where the stroke field was in 1999 with the um, development of the STAIR, the Stroke Therapy Academic Industry Roundtable. Really, it was a, an effort to um, coordinate the field to say, okay, um, various people are using various models. What are the steps and guidelines in terms of the models we think are, 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 are um, valid? And how do we move the field forward in terms of study design and reporting? So, I'll leave with a quote from a statistician, in God we trust, all others bring, and I've put in good data. So, thank you, and I look forward to uh, your discussion at the end of the session. I want to just acknowledge my colleagues from Sunnybrook who support me, various funding agencies, and my lab, and in particular, Dianchi Wang, and Shaheen um, Kode, and, uh, who helped with the slides very late last night when I learned this thing was being live streamed. And uh, also Lauren Morton, who's, who's now an independent investigator at the University of Toronto. Great. Thank you.